from the Psych Hub Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Burnout Antidote, infusing well-being into healthcare culture. I'm Amy Perlman. And I'm here today with my colleague. Hey, folks. Paul Dager here. And we are here to talk about empathy fatigue in healthcare delivery. Mm. Yeah. Could we think of something more tied into our topic about burnout and moral distress, Amy? This one I've really been looking forward to. It's, it's funny how you say looking forward to, and then I also kind of feel a sense of resistance in talking about this one because it, it <laughs> well, might have- weird when I said looking forward to for a moment, like that sounds kind of strange. What I mean is I want to do right by this topic. Yeah. I, I can follow that. I can follow that. This one hit a little bit close to home to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you know, it takes me back when I used to teach mindfulness to healthcare professionals and we usually, there's like a six week class and we had a whole class dedicated to this topic. And so I, I, I'm glad to revisit. And the reality is that this work by its very nature is exposure to human suffering. And I just want to open up with that, that um, when you choose to do healthcare work, you are choosing to, unlike being an accountant or um, a Barista. And I'm not meaning to belittle those things, but there's just this exposure that comes with the territory. Uh, yeah. I started thinking about it in terms of this idea of, of empathy. Um, mm-hmm. And I know you like to define things, so I'll let you define it and then I'll pop in with my idea. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Well, yeah, you're, I'm, I'm the word guy here. So when I used to teach this, because I even found when I first explored this area, I got confused. Like, what what's the difference between empathy and compassion? And I found this framework really um, gave me good reference points. And so the idea that empathy is what it, it I give the metaphor of two tuning forks. And if you have two tuning forks of the same note, if you tap one, the other one starts to sing out without any contact with the first tuning fork. And to me, that's what empathy is like, that we are in the, when we're in the presence of any really strong emotion, could be joy or sorrow, that as humans, we resonate, we feel it in our body. It's just part of being human. And maybe even with non-humans, you know, if you see, you know, other you know, climate change and the earth suffering, maybe that's, I'm sure that's part of it too. Compassion then is this urge to take action to ease the suffering of another. And I really think about in healthcare, I think this is such a driver for folks. But I remember learning early on this clarity around empathy fatigue versus compassion fatigue. And that really compassion is not the thing that gets fatigued, it's this constant exposure to suffering. Empathy is what gets fatigued. Compassion depends upon empathy. And so today's episode is really teasing apart this relationship of empathy and compassion in this work. And I really think that that stands out to some extent as something special um, and unique to healthcare clinicians, just as you mentioned. Mm-hmm. I think that we are highly, uh, a highly empathetic group that comes in yeah. and are more likely to feel that empathy at higher levels which may Mm -hmm. lead to more fatigue. So really understanding how do you uh, think through that empathy, not losing what is so special about understanding the suffering of others, but trying Mm -hmm. to also bring that into compassion or action that allows us to move through it. Yeah, yeah. And we have such a, a powerful description of someone who, live through this experience and actually offer some solutions too. So how about we go to our our, um, story for today about empathy, fatigue, and moral distress. My name is Paul Hutchison. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician at Loyola University Medical Center outside of Chicago. And I have been asked to share my experience with compassion fatigue. My primary work environment is the medical intensive care unit, and and that is a significant risk factor for various occupational hazards, and those include moral injury, burnout, and compassion fatigue. The latter is a distinct experience where a professional uses a lot of emotional energy caring for others, and as a result of the intense focus, they end up losing their empathic connection with their patients. And at the end of the day, the clinician has nothing left in the tank to offer patients and families usually at a time when they need the clinician the most. 
So by now, most people are aware of the extreme toll that COVID took on ICU physicians, nurses, and, and respiratory therapists. Mortalities in ICUs during COVID were significantly higher, and that was compounded by lack of available therapies early in the pandemic and lack of vaccines. So I do want to tell one story, though, that highlights the moment I realized I was experiencing compassion fatigue and then how I worked my way out of it. And I'll, I'll change some of the identifying details to protect the patient's identity. It was during one of the early months of the pandemic, and I cared for a young woman in her 30s. She was generally healthy, except for being a little overweight and having hypertension. She was admitted to the hospital with respiratory failure due to low oxygen levels, and then she was diagnosed with COVID pneumonia, and then was transferred to our intensive care unit for her high oxygen requirements. During rounds, probably on about day three of her admission, she continued to worsen and was pushing the limits of our ability to provide enough oxygen to her non-invasively without a ventilator. And I went into her room during rounds and I discussed this and she informed me that she would refuse intubation if it was offered. And this seemed like a very odd request since she had no major comorbidities, no underlying terminal condition that otherwise would have been expected to limit her lifespan independent, of course, of her COVID. I was so concerned about this preference for not being intubated I ended up having a video conference to discuss this choice with her and her parents. Her parents also seemed very skeptical of intubation and a ventilator. So I left rounds that day pretty dejected and angry, having not convinced the patient that she should accept intubation and a ventilator if it became necessary and that, and that moment was approaching. Later, one of the respiratory therapists pulled me aside and informed me that the patient confided in her that quote, she's not afraid of COVID. So that was one of the last things that I heard the patient say. As this patient's condition worsened over the course of the next 24 hours, the tone of the conversation turned from serious to dire. Ultimately, when having a further conversation with her, I learned that her reason for refusing intubation was that she had, had heard numerous news reports that COVID patients who are intubated usually die. And of course, this is true but it took an, an incredibly long amount of time to convince the patient that intubation was not elective. And in her case, if she did not receive intubation at that point, because it was necessary, the alternative was that she was going to die. So after much pleading, she finally gave in and she was intubated. And despite her rest efforts, including attempting to place her on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO, she passed away. Experiences like this made it really hard to feel empathy for a lot of patients during the pandemic. Especially after vaccines were available, it wasn't uncommon for us to ask during our, our admission history whether patients had received the vaccine. And of course, this is an important part of her history, but in retrospect, I'm not sure that information was going to change our management. Masking and gowning and putting ourselves at risk to walk into these rooms and care for the patients who weren't vaccinated, I think really took a toll on us emotionally. I know it, it took a toll on me emotionally. And I truly believe that we treated all patients the same, regardless of vaccination status, but it became really hard to provide compassion and empathy for those who had not listened to public health officials. In discussions with my other pulmonary colleagues, we frequently said that we were jaded. But in retrospect, we weren't jaded. We were fatigued and we had nothing left in the tank. So how did this get better for me? Well, I, first I, I stopped asking about vaccinations because there was no point. And it actually, was affecting the way I emotionally approached patients. I also reflected on why that one patient declined intubation. Her perspective wasn't irrational or anti-establishment, and she wasn't trying to be defiant. She was scared, and her source of information was unreliable. I reminded myself there was only so much I could do, and I gave myself permission to just do my best because that's the only thing that I could do. I knew that if I poured every last ounce of effort into every single patient who was dying of COVID, and I would have nothing left for my wife and kids at home who are also struggling with life during the pandemic. So I'm fortunate that I have a fantastic support group around me and incredible colleagues who can remind me that we're all in this together. And being willing to share my experience and listen to others is one way I can fill my tank so that I'm ready to offer my next patient and also my colleagues and my family the attention that they deserve. That really stood out to me. I appreciated what our colleague had to say about his experience and really some of the unique pieces that come into how this affected during COVID. Yeah, yeah. But some of it is outstanding from before COVID as well. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> this is going to be a bad reference, but I'm thinking about, I don't know if I can mention movie titles, but there's one where they say this goes to 11. And I think that's what COVID did. It took this normal experience and, and just amplified beyond belief. And it real it tied in for me this idea of these components of what brings together burnout that we talked about really in the first episode, yeah. and yeah. that feeling of emotional exhaustion, and mm-hmm. how much we experience in our in our personal lives, in our daily right. lives about our own emotions but taking mm-hmm. on emotions of those around us in in high stress situations really is what mm-hmm. kind of pulls it over the edge. So I think about yeah. this as kind of a container that you fill and that can kind of exactly. replenish yeah, yeah. and goes like up and down over time, but there was this overflow without the ability to pour any of it out. There was so much insight and wisdom in that story and that he really recognized that it was this emotional overload. Um, and I loved how he, you know, in, in discussions with colleagues, they used the word jaded and he took a step back and realized that that's not the right word. It was this idea of my tank is empty mm-hmm. and recognizing that um, no one can, can sustain that without refilling in some way. And the fact that the way that he refilled was one, he was stopping to ask people about um, were they vaccinated or not? Because how that brought out some anger in a sense of you wouldn't you know, be this bad off if you just did it. And they realized that, that that anger is not serving me or the patient anyway. I thought that was very helpful in terms of a sense of our own self-awareness. What is it that yeah. we bring to the work? Mm-hmm. What are the things that fill our tank? And what are the things that detract from it? And just Right. trying to give ourselves the best chance to be successful as possible. And again, there was so much wisdom in here when he spoke about this. I heard him speak to limits as a human being doing this work. I have limits. And, you know, again, as healthcare professionals, I think we have superpowers sometimes that we're superhuman and we're not. And that that's what turned the tide for him where he recognized I do have limits with exposure to suffering and there's some things that actions I have to take to, to remedy this and be able to sustain myself in this career that I chose. And I really applaud that. I yeah. thought um, I read an article or saw a news story. I don't even remember the source of it, but this idea of when there were all the standing ovations for healthcare clinicians that all, almost yeah. a hero's welcome or a hero's Thank you. But this right. idea of not being a superhero and what you said, and I also think our, our colleague's story as well, tie into we are all human. We do yeah. what we can, but we all have limits. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that there was that pushback about it seemed, and I remember we actually had a cowbell and there was like a, there was, a, was it seven o'clock in the evening, you would howl and, and ring bells for the healthcare workers. And there was some pushback and the signs in front of all the, where my mom was in a, a assisted living, it was, you know, thank you, healthcare heroes. And did not realize in some ways we caused harm with that because we we deprive them of being human and being affected. And it's just, it's, it's fascinating to recognize that, um, no, the, the most compassionate thing we can do is to honor the humanity of, of healthcare workers. Us healthcare clinicians are driven to heal and help others. At PsychHub, we offer a wide variety of content that can support your well-being, help you find new creative and evidence-based ways to practice, and get inspired again. Whether you want to better understand depression, or you're interested in providing trauma-informed care, or you want to learn about navigating grief, our vast library of educational content has you covered. PsychHub offers curated continuing education learning opportunities on a variety of timely and relevant mental health topics and evidence-based interventions geared specifically toward healthcare and mental health providers. These custom learning programs will empower you to support better mental health for patients, colleagues, and yourself. Learn more about our evidence-based mental health education opportunities at psychhub.com. 
that brings us to the second component in terms of this emotional exhaustion, but also this self-compassion that I think, Mm -hmm. not to use the word antidote too much, although we do use it every every time, definitely (laughs) applies here, really thinking about that ability to know yourself, to think through yeah. what you need and to be kind to yourself and understand that the community here, different people need different things, but trying to right. be thoughtful about that. Yeah. And this sense of making a safe space where you can say, I am not okay. Or you ask someone, are you okay? And this idea of self-compassion and compassion becomes the norm of how we interact with each other. And I have a wonderful practice that I want to share with our listeners of a way to encourage this. Unless you have something else to say, you look like it's something else to say. No, I, <laughs> my only other piece of what to say is thinking about okay. how we can respond as a community uh, or as a system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have been very thoughtful all along our journey to mm-hmm. not make all the work be around one person doing that work. So exactly, yeah. I yeah. like to apply that here in terms mm-hmm. of how do we create systems where you can mm-hmm. check in and genuinely ask, how are you doing mm-hmm. today? How did you respond yeah. to that? Seems like your caseload is full of high risk situations or high yeah. emotions. And what can I do to support you? Start to reinforce that versus all the accolades for when you are the superhero. You know, and, and stepping up is a beautiful thing, but it's not sustainable. So I, um, as we talk about antidote, um, and it's been recognized in, in the literature that self-compassion is the antidote to empathy fatigue. And I'm going to ask the producers to throw this link um, into the notes, a self-compassion journaling exercise. And I want to recognize everyone's not a writer. And so take what I'm sharing. And if you want to do it through talking into a recorder, singing a song, drawing, painting, talking to a colleague, you determine how this is going to work best for you. And taking a few quiet moments, and I know that's asking a lot, but let me, let me suggest this will give back to you in so many ways and going through the following um, questions to ponder and, and document or write down. What do you feel bad about for today? And and bad is, I don't know if that's a good term. You know, what what impacted you today in a way that's challenging or draining? And then how are you judging yourself for that moment or maybe the entire day? And then what caused you pain and suffering today? And creating a space where you can be vulnerable with yourself and let that out. And then bringing around the three elements of self-compassion to that pain and suffering. So mindfulness is just fully honoring what you feel, shame, sadness, fear, anger, and maybe even asking, what is this emotion telling me? That's what emotions are. They're just simply information. Maybe simply is the wrong word. And then common humanity is recognizing as a human, I'm not alone feeling this this is part of the human experience. And then self-kindness is if a dear friend or you know a really good colleague was feeling this, what would you say to them and offer those words to yourself? So Amy, what do you want to add to that as our tool for today? I will add to that. First, my reaction of when you say to journal, it reminds me of when I used to do crisis planning as a clinician. Mm. And I would say mm. every clinician puts, uh, puts journaling on the crisis plan. And very few people (laughs) actually do it. I encourage people to take this as a practice in whatever that means. Exactly. I also loved the idea of trying it out for a week and seeing how that Mm -hmm. feels. I do like recording it or writing the notes, recording it in some way, either written or or audio, so that there's a way to look back on some patterns and get to know ourselves better. Yeah, I think that's the key. Is there some way you can revisit it? Because I know when I've done practices like this, when you come back, it's really, um, I was just talking to someone about journaling the other day, and there's the the moment you do it, and then when you revisit it later, both of those can be quite impactful. 
I I agree. So I I would encourage others to to question your reaction as well if yours is, hey, I don't want a journal. Uh, this didn't feel like a standard journaling exercise. Yeah, sometimes that word, almost like when you give, you know, when you're work, doing therapy with a client, you bring up the word homework, there's, there's pushback immediately and journaling may be tainted as well. So if that word doesn't work, throw it out and just, what is a way to get this out of you in a way that then you can take a back look at it? I really like this idea of kind of bringing in these parts of yourselves to fi- figure out what is your tank, what gives you what gives mm-hmm. you energy or what gives you a sense of maybe even peace. Um, mm. And that idea of, of action. So knowing where you can protect yourself and also still yeah. feel like you are reacting as a human. Okay. Yeah, I like that. We've already talked about this idea of to be human is to have a tank that can go go to empty. And and what is your way to refill that tank? Our offering for this, the, the journaling exercise is one way, but imagine there's many ways you can refill your tank. Uh, Chris Germer is a psychologist um, at Harvard, and I heard him talk about compassion. And I loved when he gave the sense of compassion. Sometimes we think it's kind of like soft and fluffy. Yeah, I hate the term soft skills because I think the hardest skills in the world are these soft skills. But he says compassion can be strong like a mama bear and it could be saying no and motivation to, to take the steps to do the hard things because sometimes taking care of yourself is hard to do. And I just, I loved reframing compassion as a force as opposed to something kind of soft and fluffy. I love that. And I think that is when we talk about doing and being on this podcast. Yeah. Uh, sometimes they aren't so different. So I like to think about being a force and doing an action mm. as a combination. And sometimes that combination like that. is really what feels healing and like it's the thing that'll help us change the world. Yeah. That's all we're trying to do here is just change the world. And let's let's see how far we can get. <laughs> So, Amy, I I think I think we did well by this topic, if I may say so. I feel good about it. And yeah, we will we will be back next time talking about how to have a voice and expanding diversity of voices at the table in healthcare systems. Mm, yeah, that's a noble topic as well. I look forward to exploring that with you. Me too. See you next week. All right. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so at podcast at psychhub.com. To be notified of new episodes, don't forget to like, subscribe, or follow wherever you're listening. And reviews are so helpful, so please do leave one if you can. It allows others to find us and to join along. The Burnout Antidote is executive produced and edited by Jacob Morrison. Research is assisted by Tecla Ross. Show artwork was created by Ornella Jangoli and Ashton Smith. A very special thanks to Juliana Castro, Alyssa Fackler, Trevin Stiegel, Andrea Womack, and of course, our pet, Pickles. The Burnout Antidote is a co-production from Psych Hub and is brought to you by Janssen Neuroscience.